Welcome to the Docketing Excellence Webinar Series. Welcome to the Docketing Excellence Webinar Series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and the SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is an accurate, efficient, and cost-effective U.S.-based IP docketing and paralegal service provider. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman Lundberg Wissner firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we have pulled together docketing experts and managers from the Schwegman firm, Black Hills IP, and their respective clients and customers to help educate on key docketing challenges and issues and to share best practices on how to overcome them. The Docketing Excellence webinar series is free. There are two more webinars after this one in May. To listen to our past webinars, of which there are many, and to register for future webinars, go to the Docketing Excellence series tab on the Black Hills IP website, which is www.blackhillsip.com. Also, just a note that we launched a new version of our, of our website recently. So if you had been going to our website to the webinars tab, that is now the Docketing Excellence Series tab, and that's where the information on future webinars, seminars, and our Docketing Excellence LinkedIn group can be found. In the future, we'll be adding additional content, content to that as well. The webinar that we are presenting today is the 15th in this series. Today's topic is the EPO opposition docketing process. We have allowed time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions may be submitted using the Q&A button on the control bar on your screen. You can sit a, submit a question at any time during the presentation. The question will be held in the queue until the end of the presentation. Before we announce our speakers today, I want to announce that we have scheduled three more live in-person docketing seminars. We did our first docketing seminar in San Jose, California in February. We're now going to do a docketing seminar in Minneapolis on June 8th, and then in Chicago on September 7th, and in Washington, D.C. on November 8th. And these are full day advanced docketing seminars. So hopefully, if you weren't able to attend in San Jose, you'll be able to join one of these other seminars. You can go to our website to get information on those and to register. Our presenters today are myself, Jennifer Bementry, and Linda Swanson. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 20 years experience in patent prosecution. I was a partner at the Schweigman firm for 10 years, and I was also a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center for five years. Jennifer, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jennifer Bomentry, and I'm a paralegal in the foreign department with Schweigman, Lundberg, and Wisner, and I've been with the firm for about nine years now. I handle foreign applications for our Schweigman clients. Prior to that, I was an in-house paralegal at Graco, where I worked on U.S. and foreign trademarks, U.S. and foreign patents, annuities, and IP budgeting. I started out in IP as an administrative assistant at Merchants and Gould, so I've been in IP for about 16 years now. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Linda, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Swanson, and I have been in the patent world for about 45 years now. Um, I was a, I'm a retired foreign filing paralegal from the Schweigman, Lumberg and Wissner law firm. I worked there for 21 years. Previous to that, I was a paralegal at, a foreign paralegal at the Merchant and Gould firm for 18 years. And right now I'm a part-time employee for Black Hills IP. Great. Well, Jennifer, thank you for coming back to another webinar, and Linda, thank you for joining us. Today, we'll be talking about European opposition. Patent opposition proceedings are common in the EPO, but not common enough that most docketers in U.S. organizations are very comfortable with them. So today, we'll be talking about just 
the general filing of an opposition, the initial portion of an opposition proceeding, which I'll call the opposition, opposition division proceeding, and then the opportunity to appeal if your decision is uh, viewed by you as unfavorable, which will be the Board of Appeal proceeding. And then finally, a very limited procedural option at the end, which is an enlarged Board of Appeal. And then in the event that your patent is maintained in an amended form, uh, what do you have to do? What are the requirements from a docketing standpoint for that? So after an opposition is filed, like I said, there's an initial proceeding referred to as the opposition division proceeding. There's three possible outcomes of that proceeding. Your patent could be revoked completely. Your patent could be upheld as it was initially granted, or your patent could be upheld, but uh, it has to be amended. That outcome of the op opposition division proceeding is what may be appealed to the Board of Appeals uh, as the next part of that process. And as I said, in extremely rare circumstances, there may be an additional appeal to an enlarged Board of Appeals, but that's extremely rare. So before we go into all of those different aspects of the opposition process and how to docket them, let's step back and talk about oppositions generally. And just first off, Jennifer and Linda, what is an opposition? We don't have these in the U.S. So your European patent has granted and you've validated in your countries of choice. There's a period of time after your patent grants where someone, and any company or uh, anybody that's an interested party can oppose that patent and try and get that patent um, to be revoked. And that's what this whole opposition proceeding is about. Um, so it happens after the grant of a European patent, and um, it can be two or more parties that are involved in the opposition. Um, they can be docketed, well, you have, you can be an opposer, or you can be the patent owner whose patent has been opposed. So there's two different points of view, or two different sides to an opposition, and it's always important to remember at every stage of your proceedings, what party are you? Are you the patent owner whose patent has been um, challenged? Or are you the party that's opposing a European granted patent? So how often do oppositions come up? Well, I've been at Schwagman for like nine years and in-house before that and with Merchants and Gould. So in my entire 16 years doing intellectual property work, I've handled a grand total of two oppositions. And they were both yours, Anne. <laughs> so in my 20 years, I've done two and they were the two I worked on with you. <laughs> and uh, for me, um, I, I had a client at the Schwagman firm that um, Basically, the only one of the main countries that they only filed in was Europe, and they were involved in at least I recall 16 or more patents of theirs being opposed. So it, it, it kind of can fluctuate from technology to technology. I think a lot of it depends on the technology you're in, the type of patent that you're you've gotten granted, and um, competitors in your field because I think Linda with your clients there were a couple of competitors in that field and they would regularly watch your clients granted patents and to see what's been granted and then file their oppositions so you could you could go from two oppositions in 20 years to what Linda handled 16 of them well let's talk about the opposition process uh, to start off with, somebody has to initiate the process, and that uh, initiation has to be done or done. Um, so that opposition, if it's going to be filed, has to be filed within nine months of the grant of the patent. And the terminology, if you're looking at your EPO documents for grant, is the publication of the notice of the grant. If you are acting as the opponent 
Well, actually, Jennifer, I'll let you talk about what do you need to docket for the initial filing of an opposition, and I assume you'll probably talk about those two different perspectives that you just mentioned. So if I'm the patent owner and I've received a granted European patent, um, there will be a deadline within uh, nine months from when your publication of your grant that you're going to be monitoring. You're going to be checking um, to see if you've received any paperwork from your European associate to say, congratulations, no one has opposed this granted European patent, or in the unlikely event you do receive an opposition, your European associate will notify you, hey, your patent has been opposed. Here's the communication from the European Patent Office. Um, so the first deadline, you're going to be monitoring. And there's going to be no action on the part of you if you are a patent owner or a patent holder. There will be no action for you to take. You're either going to close that deadline when you receive the notice that nobody's opposed your patent, or if you do get a notice of opposition, you're going to still close that deadline. And what, uh, it, what at Schwegman we would do is we would open up a whole separate file, um, a whole separate matter in our system to handle all of the opposition proceedings. If you are the party that is doing the opposing, if you're going to oppose another party's granted patent, you would not do that in a patent prosecution matter or a patent prosecution file. You're going to open a separate matter in your system and you're going to be monitoring the prosecution of that European application. And then when you see that it's getting close to grant, you're going to be docketing your nine month deadline to oppose that European patent. Okay. So um, we had put a poll because I wanted to see what the level of experience of our audience was for having dealt with opposition. And the first question was, have you ever docketed deadlines for an opposition in Europe other than the initial deadline to file. 49% of the audience said yes, but 51% have never docketed for an opposition. Then the second question was, if yes, were you docketing for the patent owner or the opponent? Interestingly, only 40% said they were docketing for the patent owner, 60% said they were docketing for the opponent. So our focus today and a lot of these slides are going to assume that you're docketing for the patent owner, which most of our audience hasn't done, and that's what we're going to walk through in detail today. Um, getting back to what we were just discussing, Anne, um, earlier we, um, we had talked about the fact that we would open up a, se a separate matter if you're the opposer or even if you're the patent owner, you're going to set up a separate matter to handle um, the opposition proceedings. Um, Linda had mentioned that if you're looking for documents from the European Patent Office, if you go online to um, the European Patent Office to look for documents, they do not differentiate oppositions in any way, in a separate way. You're going to find all those documents just um, proceeding as part of that granted European patent. So they're not going to have anything separate or different, you just would go to the matter for that granted European patent and the documents would flow from there. Great comment. So even though as docketers we think about these as separate records and separate matters in the um, EPO system online, it's all grouped together with the original examination and prosecution for that patent. That's a great tip, I didn't know that. Trying to go to my next slide. There we go, got it. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, after the opposition is filed, there's an initial proceeding referred to as the opposition division proceeding. 
We're going to talk about that part of the process first and docketing for that part of the process first. And as I said, um, this, uh, the next few slides are going to assume that you are docketing for the patent owner. So the slide that you're looking at is an overview of the documents that are coming from the EPO and the documents that are being filed by the patent owner. So the blue boxes show documents that as a docketing department you're going to be receiving from the EPO, they're being sent by the EPO. And the yellow boxes show documents that are being filed by the patent owner. And the steps, the numbered steps in the middle show the sequence that these come in. So the first document that the EPO sends out is a communication of notice of opposition. The second document that the EPO sends out is a communication of notice of opposition under Rule 79-1. We'll go into these uh, individually in, in detail as we move forward. After that, there are observations and amendments to be filed by the patent owner, and also there's opportunity for the opposer to respond as well. Then the EPO will send out a summons to attend the oral proceedings. There will be opportunity for the patent owner to submit written submissions, and I think also for the opposer to re reply to those as well. The oral proceeding will happen. I don't have that shown on this drawing because I'm just uh, showing items that are filed. After the oral proceeding, there will be a written decision that comes out that's referred to as the interlocutory decision in the opposition proceeding. And then if either party is unhappy with that decision and wants to continue to pursue this, there will be a uh, notice of appeal that needs to be filed and typically followed up separately by a statement of the grounds for the appeal, which are more detailed. So let's talk about each of these documents in detail. The first document that you'll receive after an opposition is filed is called the communication of notice of opposition. This is the initial notice from the patent office or from the EPO to the patent owner to notify them that an opposition against their patent has been filed. And it contains the details of the opposition. That might be um, what patent's being opposed, who the party or parties are that are opposing the patent, what claims are being opposed, the grounds for the opposition, and um, whether or not oral proceedings are requested, although I would think almost all the time somebody would request oral proceedings. So Linda, how do you docket this initial notice when it comes in? Um, I, I would docket that, uh, I would put on my personal docket as a foreign paralegal, a one month follow up uh, to, and at that time I would go and check the EPO patent register to see if any documents have issued yet from the EPO. Uh, and I also just want to mention too that your foreign associate, your European associate will also be uh, checking on these documents as well. But I just like to have a heads up and make sure that I know when the date's coming. If nothing has been issued yet from the EPO after that one initial first month, I would docket another follow-up for a further one month and go out to the EPO and check again. If I don't see anything at that level, I would just send a quick email to my European associate and ask uh, if they could do a, a status follow-up or just if they have any information for me. Okay, so you're docketing reminders, but there's no actual response or reply due no. to the document, right? Correct. So there, there's nothing that has to be docketed, but it's the best practice to track and put a reminder or status check or something on your docket to check to see if the next item which is the communication under Rule 791 uh, has been issued, right? Absolutely, yes. And this is also your opportunity to open up a separate matter or a separate file just to handle the opposition proceedings if that's your um, procedure. Good point. That would be the first communication that would come into the docketing department, and there at this point isn't a separate record for the opposition, so Correct. you wind up opening a record in the docketing system too. The next slide is the actual text from this notice. And what I've highlighted here is the title of the document in yellow, the communication of a notice of opposition. And then in green, I've highlighted the fact that nothing is due. So the document says 
an invitation to file observations and to file amendments where appropriate to the description claims and drawings, that's the Rule 79-1, will be issued separately. So there's nothing that you have to do in response to this document. Uh, this document is just notifying you that an opposition has been filed. Now, the second document that you will receive as the patent owner after an opposition has been filed is a communication of the notice of opposition under Rule 79.1 of the EPC. When you're looking at these two forms side by side, that initial notice and this notice, to me, I think they look very, very similar. Uh, you have to make sure you read the body of the document to pick up on that initial language that says something will come separately, or the text of this document, which I'll show you in a moment, which actually has a deadline called out in it. So you need to look at these very, very closely to, to, to make sure you realize, is this the initial notice or is this the Rule 79 notice where I actually have to docket something? So Jennifer, what do you have to docket when this one comes in? You're going to have to docket for um, filing your arguments or observations. And also, you can amend the claims at this point. So you're going to have the main request or the claims that you really want to pursue as the first set of claims, but you can file several sets of auxiliary uh, claims with your arguments. So it's not, it may not be that you would file one set of claims. You may file two or three or four sets of claims hoping to get one of these sets of claims through the opposition proceedings and have those claims to be maintained at the very end. So that's an interesting note because that's unique um, in the opposition practice that you can have basically fallback position. And the opposition division in the oral proceeding, which we'll talk about in a moment, will consider all of those one by one. And at the point here where you're filing those observations, you may file multiple, officer, um, multiple auxiliary requests like that, right? Yes, and I think uh, the one that we worked on together, it was our auxiliary claim set too that ended up being upheld at the very end. Yeah, so we had multiple ones. Uh, also, just to note, I've noted here that this four-month deadline is from the notification of the communication which means that the 10 day rule applies. And if you haven't been on one of our previous webinars where we've talked about the 10 day rule in European practice, it's very common for US uh, professionals to refer to a 10 day grace period, but there really is no such thing as a 10 day grace period with the European Patent Office when it comes to deadlines. Rather, they have what they call a 10 day notification period that is calculated from the mailing date of the document, and then the deadline for responding, in this case four months, is, is calculated from that 10 day, the, the end of the 10 day period. So you take the mailing date, you add 10 days to that, and then you add four months to that date to determine what the actual deadline is at the European Patent Office. And that is your actual deadline. Now, in this case, there is a two-month extension that's also available. So here's an example of the communication of notices of opposition under Rule 79.1 of the EPC. So the, again, the yellow is highlighting the title of the document, and the green color highlights, in this case, what is due in response to this document. So you can see by looking at the uh, first line that I have shaded in green, you are requested to file your observations within a period of four months from notification of this communication. So there's your four month response deadline. And how do you know the 10 day rule applies in this one? The text doesn't, the, the highlighted text we have here doesn't really say. Ah, that's a really good question. The way you can tell is when it says four months from notification of this communication. Any EPO document that you're looking at that has a deadline from notification means the 10 day rule applies. Otherwise, it's calculated from the mailing date. But here, if that notification period is 10 days after the mailing date, and then your response is due four months from notification. So those are the magic words to look for in the document to be able to tell if the 10 day rule applies or not. 
All right, now um, that uh, you've received the communication that you have um, observation to do, the opposition division will send a communication to the opponent to enable the opponent to comment on the observations and amendments that are filed by the patent owner. So basically the opposer can file counter arguments to your submission if you're the patent owner. Um, and similar time period for that, they have a four month deadline for responding, 10 day rule applies, and the, um, there's a two month extension of time. It's really important, and to remember what party you are in the opposition. So if you're the patent owner, in this case, when you get this communication in from the, Euro from the opposition division or the Euro European associate, um, this is not our deadline to handle. This is the deadline for the opposer to file comments. So we don't have to take any action when we receive this particular communication. So that's why it's really important to watch if um, if you're the patent owner or if the if you're the opposer, because in this instance we we don't have any deadline to satisfy. Well, and I think that's one of the tricky things about docketing oppositions at the EPO is there are two parties involved, and some deadlines um, are not your deadline if you're the patent owner, and that's um, something that people docketing in patent press in the patent prosecution area don't usually have to deal with. Uh, two-party proceedings. So that is a tricky thing, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's great. All right. The next item, and I don't have an example of that document, but the next item uh, we, we will have an example of, and that's the summons to attend the oral proceeding pursuant to Rule 115.1 of the EPC. This is the notice from the EPO uh, with the scheduling details for the oral proceeding. The oral proceeding is a hearing in front of the opposition division. The, um, the summons sometimes may include in that document a preliminary non-binding opinion of the opposition division. It's not their final decision, but occasionally they will, sometimes they will have a preliminary opinion on there, but you still have to have the, there will still be a hearing and that's what this document is setting up. So um, how do we docket the summons to attend the oral proceeding? Uh, you would, uh, the, the date and time and place of the oral proceeding is uh, right in the middle of the document usually and it's set out very clearly. Um, it's, it's gonna be usually at the EPO in Munich. A lot of times it could be at the Hague it gives you the date, uh, and then further down in the document, you, it, it shows you that you have one month prior to the oral proceeding to file your written submissions. So those are the two main dates that you you need to docket for that. Um, and also note that there's no extensions or 10-day period, 10-day rule applies to this case. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, after you filed your arguments and your main request and auxiliary claims and the opposer has filed their comments, you might get a one to two year period of time where nothing happens. Um, you haven't received the summons to attend oral proceeding and your case is just kind of hanging out there. So you may want to end up docketing some sort of a status check. Um, after your opposer has filed their um, has filed their observations, um, your foreign agent or your European associate is going to be the one responsible for handling the docketing and monitoring this matter at the EPO. But so a status check isn't particularly necessary, but you might want to do that just so you can, if if it's been a super long time, just contact your associate and say, do you have a status on this? Do you know what's going to be happening? And that they will usually end up corresponding with the European Patent Office and that might trigger the summons to the oral proceedings. Good, good point. Um, here's an example of text from a summons to attend oral proceedings. And the again, the yellow highlighting is the title of the document. 
Linda mentioned that the, the date and time and actually the location as well is in the middle of the document. So that's that green box. In this case, it's um, November 13th, 2014 at nine o'clock in Munich. The, um, the final deadline for written submissions, which is typically one month before, as uh, Linda mentioned, is also called out that the bottom green shaded area where you can see that deadline is November, or, I'm sorry, October 13th, 2014. So for this particular document, the due dates are just going to be called out in the document. You just have to take a look at the document, get them from the document. And something to mention, um, these documents look quite similar to the sim something that you might receive while an application is pending. So you want to make sure that it doesn't get misdocketed into a matter, into your European application that's already granted if you've opened up a separate matter for your opposition. Oh, or even if you had a divisional or something else that was still pending, if somebody got confused by the reference numbers, Exactly. It in the wrong matter. Exactly. And um, you don't want to miss these dates. So in a matter that's already listed as granted, it might it might easily get confused and your docketing deadline may could possibly get missed. So you want to make sure that since they look so similar and things are called the same, um, you know, you've got written submissions, you've got oral proceedings, that happens while the application is pending too. You want to just make sure to Double check these documents to get them into the correct matter. Great point. All right, usually at an oral proceeding, a verbal decision will be given at the end of the proceeding, but that will be followed up by a written decision in minutes of the hearing that are typically sent out about six months after the oral proceeding. That written decision is referred to as an interlocutory decision in opposition proceedings under Article 1013A and 106.2 under the EPC. So this is the written decision of the opposition division. This is appealable by either party, depending on the party's perspective, whether it was favorable or not favorable, this decision can be appealed. So how do you um, docket the appeal. So, so you're going to docket two things. The first thing you're going to docket is the notice of appeal due. That deadline is about two months from the notification of the decision. Um, and the 10-day 10 10-day 10 rule does apply because, again, it's listed as a notification of the communication. So when you have this notice of appeal, to, it's, a, it's a minimal statement saying we are intending to appeal this and you pay fees. The next thing you're going to docket is the statement of grounds of appeal. That's four months from the notification of the decision. And again, the 10 day rule does apply. Um, both of these deadlines, both the notice of appeal and the statement of grounds of appeal are not extendable. Your statement of grounds of appeal is going to be really similar to what you might see in the US as an appeal brief. Um, in this case, it's possible to include arguments and even prior new prior art if you're the opponent in an appeal. The only restriction is no new grounds can be alleged in the appeal. And the four, just as a reminder, the four grounds for the appeal are novelty and inventiveness, non-statutory subject matter, subject matter added to the claims, and the last one is patent is not enabling. So this is just an example of what one of these documents look like. Titles highlighted in yellow. The possibility for appeal is highlighted in green down at the bottom. And I also want to point out in the very middle of this document, you see in bold the word main request. That's identifying the documents um, that will be maintained for this patent. It could be like in the example of the one you and I worked on, auxiliary request number two or something like that. So that's saying if there were multiple requests, which is the one that was the one um, that the decision is based on. All right, so we just discussed the documents sent by the EPO as part of the initial proceeding, referred to as the opposition division proceeding. The decision from the 
opposition division proceeding can be appealed to a Board of Appeals. So next we'll talk about the Board of Appeals part of the process. This is a high level uh, view of the documents. Again, the ones in blue are the ones that are received from the EPO by the docketing department or docketer. The ones in yellow are the ones that are filed with the EPO by the patent owner. Again, we're assuming that um, you are docketing for the uh, patent owner. So you're the, the party whose patent is being challenged. So just real quickly, this part of the process is kicked off by a notice of appeal being filed uh, by the patent owner if they were the ones that had the unfavorable decision or otherwise it would be by the opponent. The EPO will issue a document called a commencement of proceedings before the Board of Appeal. And that's basically just a notification that a appeal has been initiated. Having filed the notice of appeal, the patent owner, if they're the one who filed it, will have to follow up with a statement of the grounds for appeal. Then um, there will eventually be a summons to attend oral proceedings to go through a very similar process on the appeal. Written submissions will be due before the oral proceedings. The oral proceedings will be a, a, an in-person hearing. And then after that hearing, there will be a decision that's called the decision of the technical board of appeal. So that's the high level. Now let's look at these documents that are involved. After the notice of appeal is filed, the first item that will come from the EPO is called a commencement of proceedings before the board of appeal. That's the notice to the patent owner or opponent from the EPO that a appeal has been filed. And it is only sent out if the appeal meets the various formality requirements, fees paid, uh, filed timely, things like that. When that notice is sent out, do you have to docket anything? Uh, no, there is no docket entry at this time. Nothing, nothing is needed to be done by the docketing department. Okay. So here's an example. Uh, very simple. There's not much to one of these things. It just, you know, it's got the title of the document and it references a letter dated the particular date that it was filed uh, by the opponent uh, and indicates that there was. That's, that's what you get is a notice that a notice of appeal has been filed. Now that is not setting up any other due dates because the deadline, as we talked about earlier, for the grounds of appeal being due, or I'm sorry, the statement of the grounds of appeal being due were triggered off that original decision. After that, a statement of grounds of appeal is filed. The Board of Appeal will send a communication to the non-appealing party to let the non-appealing party comment on the grounds of appeal. So they get an opportunity to do that as well. And Jennifer, how's that docketed? The opposer will have an opportunity to respond if they're the party that, um, that right, thank you. Party. Right, the non-appealing party will have an opportunity to respond. That deadline is docketed four months from the notification of the communication. And the 10-day rule does apply because, again, it's a notification. And two months extension, two months extensions may be requested if, um, if necessary or required. Okay. So after both parties get their um, observations in, um, the board will send a summons to attend the oral proceedings pursuant to Rule 115 of the EPC. So again, similar to the summons we looked at a few minutes ago, this is a notice from the EPO with the scheduling details for the oral proceedings concerning the appeal. Um, it may include, again, a non-biting opinion of the Board of Appeal. And um, how is this one docketed, Linda? Oh, the, the summons, it's basically docketed the same way that your other summons to attend oral proceeding was. The, the date of the oral proceedings is date, time, and place are set out in the document. There will also be a paragraph stating the deadline to file your written submissions, which would be your arguments and, and or claim amendments, which is usually uh, one to two months before the date of the oral proceeding. 
And again, just remember that the date of the oral proceeding is not extendable. So I don't have an example of this document, but it looks pretty much like the other one we looked exactly, at. Exactly, yes. Uh, the date and time all set out right in the middle of the document. And again, for docketing purposes, you just have to read the document. It's going to tell you when the oral proceeding is and when written submissions are due and take them off the document. So after the um, oral proceeding, then there will be a decision by the Board of Appeal, and that's called a decision of the Technical Board of Appeal. This is the written decision of the Board of Appeal. The important thing to note is this decision is not appealable. You are pretty much done at this point, and only in very rare circumstances can there be a further appeal of this decision to the enlarged Board of Appeal. So that uh, an appeal to the enlarged Board of Appeal, like I said, is very limited. It's a petition for review on the grounds that there were procedural defects in the conduct of the appeal or that there was a criminal act related to the appeal. So this is something um, that very rarely happens. But there is a deadline to docket here, and that would be the deadline to file the petition, and that is two months from the decision of the Technical Board of Appeal. Now, we've talked about the various outcomes of um, the opposition process, and those are the patent could be completely revoked, the patent could be upheld as granted with no changes, or it could be upheld with amendments from, those auxiliary, from one of those auxiliary requests. If the patent is upheld in amended form, the EPO will send out a communication pursuant to Rule 82.2 of the EPC. So this is received when the appeal decision maintains the patent in amended form or the op opposition division maintains the patent in amended form and no appeal is filed. In either case, if your result is the patent is upheld on amendment, you would get this document. This document sets up the requirement to pay an EPO publication fee and uh, tra get translations of the claims that are also due. Um, okay, so this is docketed with a three month deadline from the notification of this communication, and it's from the notification of the communication, so the 10 day rule applies. I have an example of this document. And you can see, again, heading on the documents at the very top, highlighted in yellow. The deadline is highlighted in green towards the top of the document and says to enable the patent to be maintained in the amended form, um, in the amended form communicated, the patent proprietor is requested within a period of three months from the notification of this communication to pay the fee for publication and to file the translation. So those are two things that have to be done. Uh, again, Anne, this is something really important to pay attention to because almost everything that happens in the European Patent Office has a four-month deadline or a two-month deadline or a four-month deadline and a two-month extension. You almost never see something that's docketed with a three-month deadline. So when you're looking at this deadline, Make sure you dock it just the three months and don't make the mistake of docketing it like you would during the prosecution of an application where you have four months to validate and file the translated claims. So it's really important because if you dock it the four months or if your system will automatically generate a four month deadline, you need to override it because this isn't a four month deadline, it's a three month deadline and you don't want to miss providing the publication fees and the retranslated claims. That's another tricky thing about, about opposition. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the next page is just the, the remaining page of this document. And then not only do you have to um, file new translations and uh, pay the publication fee, you also have to go through the validation process again if you come out of the opposition with a patent that's maintained in amended form. So something was changed about the patent in the opposition process, 
And so you have to, as a patent owner, revalidate the amended patent in the countries that were designated in the original patent if you want to continue to have protection in those countries. So how is that docketed? So the deadline to revalidate, again, it's an odd one for the European Patent Office. It's a three-month deadline from the date of the republication of the granted um, or of the granted patent in amended form. So you're, you, again, when you're validating a European application, you have a, usually have a four-month deadline. So this is something, again, to be aware of. The deadline is different. You're going to maybe have to look at your system to see what gets docketed and change it to make sure that you hit that three-month deadline. And also, the other thing to point out here is you, re you can read validate in all the countries you originally val validated the European patent in, but you don't have to. You can go with a shorter list of countries if your client has decided they're not interested in some of the other ones they had. Um, so you can shorten that list, you just can't broaden the list. You can't validate in a country you hadn't previously validated the patent in. Okay, so this is just real quickly an example of what this form looks like. Again, uh, pretty straightforward. So uh, I just want to remind the audience that questions regarding our program today can be submitted using the Q&A button on the control bar on your screen. If you have any questions about Black Hills IT services or processes, please contact our Vice President of Sales, Jim Burphy. Um, today we discussed how to docket deadlines for EP oppositions. Uh, more specifically, we talked about filing an opposition, the initial opposition division proceeding, the Board of Appeal proceeding, the limited circumstances where you could have an enlarged Board of Appeal, and finally, what you have to do if your patent is maintained in an amended form. We have a few questions. Let's take a look at this. Um, so, which one do you want to take here? You can do this. Okay. Article 101.3a, that's confusing. The 10-day rule applies, but there is no extension. The 10-day rule just gives you extra time, but you should not look at it as an extension, correct? So 101.3, um, U.S. practitioner, I think about these by the title of the document, not the EP <laughs> rule numbers. I need to see what that one was. I'm thinking that it's um, either the one where you have to file an appeal, but you don't get an extension of time. You just get the additional. Oh, yeah. So it's the decision, the initial decision, the interlocutory decision. Um, and yeah, that deadline for filing the appeal is not extendable. Correct. But the 10 day. Um, the 10 day does apply. Mm -hmm. So, so that is the 10 days is, is not an extension of time. That's just mm -hmm. included in the time period so that, that that gives you the final date is the months and the 10 days and then the months right after that. So, the 10 days plus four months. It's the mail date plus 10 days plus four months. And in this situation, you know, I don't know why they don't allow extensions of it, but they don't. Right. It is confusing because you think that, oh, I have a little additional time, but it that's not how the European Patent Office views it. They don't view it as an extension of time, and you shouldn't either. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. should you should just view it as this is what the final deadline is. Right. So this this uh, person said you should not look at it as, as an extension, correct? And I'd say yes. Yeah. You should not look at it as an extension. Can you confirm how the opposition timing and procedures discussed relate to timing of validation in European countries? You know, I wonder if this question was asked before we got to the validation slide. So. 
Oh, for example, is validation delayed when an opposition is filed? Um, no, usually you have already, your, your EP patent is granted and you have validated before that. So you have validated that the, those patents claims in the countries in which you want to go to have a national patent. So the validation it, is not delayed because your opposition deadline is nine months. Nine months from that, right. the issue date. Right. Your validations have occurred already, and then you get the opposition. So the, val the, the patent is granted, it's validated, then you come upon that nine-month deadline for the opposition. So you have the granted patent, and it has been validated in the countries of your choice. So validation doesn't get delayed. Okay, good. Do you usually redock or do you usually docket the revalidation period in the opposition matter or the prosecution case? That's a good question. I the I'm trying to recall what we ended up doing in our case, Anne, but I believe we redocketed that in the opposition case right. because we timing. well we had we had a we had a different set of we had the auxiliary claim set we didn't have the main claims to be to have been upheld mm -hmm. or the unadulterated claims I guess I should say so I would I would docket that in the opposition matter and not the prosecution case and I agree and I think the most important thing is however you do it you do it consistently if you have more than one opposition going on because otherwise you have a huge mess if sometimes it's in one matter and sometimes it's in another but you guys both agree you put it in the opposition record correct yes. um, so that's this one. if your patent is upheld as initially granted so there are no amendments you kept your patent are there further validation requirements? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, no. If if, every, if nothing has been changed in your original EP patent, no, there's nothing further to be done with regard to validation. Okay. Can the oral proceeding proceeding date be changed to be earlier? Can't be extended, but can you get it moved up? Um. Actually, we have tried to do that. Um, you you would have to provide a very good cause or reason why you need the, the date change, and then your your uh, European practitioner would file a document at the EPO, or he might even call the examining division. Um, but it's only at the EPO examining division's discretion that they'll change the date. I have to also just mention that. I have received multiple times uh, a change of the date of the oral proceedings by the EPO, usually for the fact that the examiner has some kind of a conflict with the date. Or it's uh, August and they're all going on vacation. Yeah, so uh, the EPO quite often changes the date of the oral proceeding. And it won't be a shorter date, it will be a, a further longer de deadline. So were you ever successful in your attempts to move up a date? You said you tried to um, do it. Right. It. Yes, yes. But it had to be a very good reason. I'm trying to think of an example of what that would be. I, I, maybe it was like jury duty or something like that, I believe. Huh. <laughs> but it's not, not something you can count on. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to the bottom one next. Can you get multiple oppositions on the same patch? Yes. R2, <laughs> on one patent. <laughs> yes, we had two different oppositions going on one European patent. <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. And also, Linda, I don't know if you mentioned this, but you can have on the same patent opposition multiple parties opposing it. Right, right. right. And you have that in a number of <laughs> yes. situations. Yes. But yeah, you can get multiple oppositions at the bad day when that happens. Um, Okay, next question is a little more general. When docketing deadlines for the EP that include the 10-day rule, should you only docket the actual date due and not include the 10-day rule? What are your thoughts? That's a great question. 
And I think whether you're an attorney or you're a paralegal or you're a doctor, you might have different answers and different thoughts on that. What do you guys think? Also, it would depend on if you're working for a corporation, if you're in-house or you're a law firm. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you what we currently do at SLW. We do not dock it to include the 10-day rule. That's just the decision that our firms made on how to handle uh, European deadlines. Um, there are European associates who will regularly send you correspondence and they will provide a deadline and it includes the 10 day rule. So I go back and forth on it, but I think everybody does it differently. The, as Anne said in the past, the most important thing to remember is whatever you do, to do it consistently. Do it the same way every, every single every time. Case. So if you're going to dock it the 10 day, you dock it the same way for everything. If you're not going to include the 10 day, don't include it and dock it the same way every time. Linda, any other thoughts? Uh, I agree with, with what Jennifer just said, especially because I worked at the Schweigman firm for many, many years. One other thing I'd like to add, though, is that if you're going to dock it using the 10 day rule, Make sure that you calculate the 10 days from the mailing date of the document first, and then add your four months onto that. And that is just to make sure that you come up with the right date, that you're not one or two days off, because that's very easy to do. Okay, so uh, you guys both say don't include it. I worry that that leads people to assume that they have extra time and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't so you have to kind of balance that as well it's a great question and there isn't a right or a wrong answer in this case it just depends on uh, your your organization's policy and on an individual attorney if you're a solo if you're a solo practitioner too mm -hmm. um, are there okay two more questions are there Further validation requirements if your patent is not upheld as initially granted. I think that's the slides that we went through. So if it's when we said if it's maintained in amended form, what we meant was it was not upheld in the form that it was initially granted in. So that slide where we talked about the revalidation was what we was the scenario that I think this person's asking about. Great. Okay. And then the last question is, where on the website do I download today's slides? If you go to blackhillsip.com, and then you go to the Docketing Excellence Series tab, that will take you to a page that has our upcoming webinars that you can register for and our past webinars. So the slides from today and the other 14 webinars that we've done in this series are available on um, that slide that spot. Also, you can register for one of the upcoming seminars. And I forgot to mention um, another way to get to these things easily is just type in docketingexcellence.com and that will redirect you to that page on our website. And that takes you to a landing page that's got all the materials and upcoming and past webinars and seminars related to the Docketing Excellence series. So thank you very much for um, attending today's program. We had a lot of content and went a little bit longer, but we appreciate everybody staying on. And I just want to uh, remind everybody about the next webinar. We have a little bit of, um, of uh, a gap here. We had a webinar scheduled for May 10th that I had to reschedule due to a, a conflict, and I try very hard to avoid, but I couldn't on this one. So the May 10th webinar, if you had been signed up for that, you would have received a notification that that's been moved to May 31st. So the next webinar is now May 24th. That was one of the originally scheduled ones at 1 o'clock Central Time. And the topic is best practices for efficient docketing of routine formalities such as U.S. powers of attorney and uh, declarations of inventors. So to uh, register for that, go to the Black Hills IP website or just type docketingexcellence.com um, and it will redirect you. 
Thank you for participating today. We hope you will join us for this and other webinars in the Docketing Excellence series and that you join our LinkedIn Docketing Excellence group. Thank you.